think we can record. All right. Martin? So, hello and welcome, you Haskellers, uh, to this uh, short talk about refinement types for Haskell or in Haskell. So, just a short intro. I'm Martin, software engineer living in Zurich, sometimes giving talks. So, uh, the talk will have a simple structure. First, we'll look at the motivation why do we need refinement types, so similar uh, approaches. Then, we will define what they, what, what, what they are. Then, we will look at the particular implementation of refinement types for Haskell, which is called Liquid Haskell. And then, we'll just, as usual, look at some practical considerations and some experience with that particular tool. So, motivation. So, in Haskell, it's like some other modern languages, we have a nice powerful type system, and this is great. This allows us to express certain properties about programs, which are also known as type safe. Right? So, we can say the program is type safe if all the types are sound and everything fits together. And even better, we can verify this with our own program. This is, typical, typical, this is called stat static type checking. We are in Haskell meetup, so everybody is a fan of static type checking, I believe. And typically, in most languages and most implementation, this is actually integrated with the compilation. In theory, we don't have to be, but usually it is. So it's a part of the compilation. The compiler does the static type checking and ensures the program type safety. But, as the first paragraph says, we can express, express certain properties to some extent. We can, we can reason about the program to to some extent, we usually still need to test. Right? The fact that the program is type safe doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. One can argue that, of course, a type unsafe program is more likely to be incorrect, and that would be true. But still, there is a there seems to be a room, room, room for, uh, for improvement. So, can we do better? Can we improve on the on those guarantees that the type safety or for standard type system gives us? So what would we do? We would, well, the whole idea of static type checking or any kind of checking and testing is to prevent errors, programming errors, right? errors in the program. And uh, we have certain classes of programming errors which are difficult or awkward to prevent simply by type system, such as, and we are listing some very common ones, division by zero, missing keys and maps, uh, infinite loops, non-termination, so these kind, of, uh, these kind of problems that uh, are usually simple bugs, but they are there. So it would be great if we could do something about this, these kind of errors and also many others. It would be great if we could express more properties about the program than just the classic type system allows us to do. But, of course, since we are all lazy, we want to keep the ability to automatically verify all those properties and all those guarantees. So, mathematically speaking, this means that verification must be a decidable problem. Whatever properties we specify, the verification has to be decidable. And, of course, we don't want uh, any additional effort by the programmer, except specification of the properties. So, no proofs, no other constructs should be required. So, is it possible? No. Some people can do this. So, enter refinement types. Uh, refinement types are one approach to achieve the, the goals we mentioned earlier, to reach more expressivity, expressivity in verification of our programs. And this is a currently an ongoing research effort. So, we'll now quickly define what the refinement type mean. Very simply, and this is maybe one slide to remember the entire presentation, refinement type is a normal type, standard type, plus a predicate. Typically using a simpler proposal, propositional logic, nothing fancy, no higher order or anything. And it can be assigned to inputs and outputs of functions, so we can, we can use these refinements to describe in more detail how the input or output of function should look. 
and we say that within the context of prefinanced types, a function or a program is type safe if given predicates are valid for all, all inputs, right? So all the potential assignments of variables. So again, you have a type, you have a predicate. That's it. The nice thing about this concept is that, as you can see, the predicates are rather added on top of types rather than being an inherent part of types. So at all times, with refining types, we can remove the predicate and the program is still a normal program. We have standard types, nothing happens. Right? So this is kind of a nice thing that it's like an optional strengthening of guarantees that can be disabled. And just very quickly about the predicates. Uh, so I mentioned uh, we can use uh, standard propositional logic. So standard Boolean operators, arithmetic operators, relations, stuff that everybody knows and everybody uses. This is what can be used in these uh, uh, expressions with the refining type predicates. Okay. Now, there is a, you can look at uh, liquid Haskell, which is an implementation of refinement types verifier, static refinement type verifier for Haskell. And um, details. Uh, this is actually an active research project at the University of California, San Diego. You can visit the page, uh, they have a pretty nice documentation and uh, links to different papers that uh, deal with uh, these topics. So as I mentioned, it's a static refinement type verifier. It's a separate tool that you can run on your Haskell sources, either one source or multiple sources, and it's going to check the refinement type safety. And it's completely automatic, nothing else is needed. So it's just like another computational step. How it actually works, in very briefly, because otherwise it would be very, very technical. Refinement type, the liquid Haskell translates refinement types, or these predicates that you mentioned, into verification conditions uh, in satisfiability model theory, uh, uh, which are expressed as a satisfiability model theory formulas, and use the SMP solver, which is usually an external tool, to verify these conditions. Uh, once again, also SMP solver verify this condition without executing the program or enumerating all inputs or anything like that. It really infers, infers the validity of those, of those conditions. There are several SMP solvers available. Liquid Haskell can cooperate in, with, in three of them, three or four of them. So one can choose which one is more, more suitable. I have tested <coughs> Why only three of them? I mean, there's a standard way to write, I think. Uh, no, don't know. They, they recently in the documentation that uh, they support certain three or maybe this is only the ones they tested, I would, I would guess, right? Okay, so another kind of limitation you have is what kind of theories you need supported. Yes, yes. And that are the currently three known ones that support yeah, these theories that don't work. Yeah. So I, I tested with Z3 from Max Research, which also seems to support a lot of different theories. Seems to be a good choice. It works. But we didn't know what was the current like, status of the competition and then as it's over. Is it three still kind of I didn't check in much detail, I just looked very quickly at the overview and seems to seem to be one of the strong ones. So I thought like, okay, this is a solid choice. It was also very easy to install, so that's good. Um, some of the others probably you would have to compile, I'm not sure. And uh, also a, a practical point, also liquid Haskell typically has to be compiled. It works, but uh, on Linux at least it works and it can, it can it has to be compiled from sources. The installation package doesn't work, so. But uh, compiled perfectly. So let's look at some examples. This is like really the best way to introduce what the liquid Haskell can do. So first, <coughs> defining refine how do we define refinement types? So here we have in liquid Haskell, all the refinement conditions are specified inside of comments like this. So this also plays well with the fact I mentioned before that you can always remove the entire refinement approach and the program will still be a standard Haskell program. So there is no special syntax introducing the language or anything like that. 
these are just comments with the special sentence here with the dash and the at sign, and this is what the liquid Haskell checker will recognize as a as its uh, directives. So, for example, here we have a definition of three types, which is pretty straightforward, and, and it's important to look at this part inside the curly bracket. So, as you can see, we have a definition of type, which we call non-zero, and these are the any values of type int which satisfy this particular predicate that, well, the value cannot be zero. Then we have another one, which is positive, very similar as well. Again, we work with integers and we have a predicate that says yes, the, the number has to be bigger than zero. And then we also introduce an odd numbers, which means that the module, uh, number module 2 has to be 1. Mm -hmm. can, can you use uh, constraint type variables in place of int in, in type definitions? Uh, yeah, we, can, we have some examples later, so that can probably enlighten that. This int so is we start simple. Sorry? Uh, this int, is it translated to a 32-bit vector or is it translated to unbounded integers? This should be a standard, standard Haskell int type. So. I mean the, the theory that it's not <coughs> because. I was thinking about the same thing. Yeah. If it's bound to the uh, Haskell and int, right, and uh, the int ha uh, uh, type in Haskell in BDC, then your verification might be correct in, on the 32 bit system and then if they're on 64 bit and for the other way. Right, right. Yeah, that's what I want to answer. Yeah, yeah. then we can do that with that. And D3 normally has like a bit string theory, so, but I don't know, and that's a good point if you go from one system to the other. Yeah. Happens. Right, but but also have so the set is going to be different size, right? Where, and on the return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it has kind of like words of bits still, so you can specify the size. I don't know what the translation. Do you also know whether it has support for unbounded integers? I think so. Yeah, well, I expect that to the three to support all of it. The question is how they will the liquid has the size class there to the three. Yeah, exactly, that's the question how they how they actually map it. No. And the thing is that these as you can see the type keyword, these are basically type uh, aliases, right? You say, oh yeah, non zero is this. Uh, here, instead of the curly braces, we could also put, put a standard, standard Pascal type definition. So, something to remember is that pretty much anywhere where there, is, there could have been a standard Pascal type definition, you can replace it with a curly braces conditional expression. That's how it works in pretty much all cases. It's very consistent. So, we have defined these. Uh, these refinements or refined types, and now we're going to use them. So we have a wonderful function one, and uh, we are going to tell, say that oh yeah, so one returns a non-zero type and it's positive and it's odd. And the when we run the program and check when we check the program with liquid Haskell, liquid Haskell is going to verify this condition, which in this case of course is trivial, and it's going to say yes, this is type safe. If we change one to zero the odd condition and non-zero are going to fail. And also, we can start combining things. So, we, we define a, a list of odd numbers, some odd numbers, and we can define a refinement here that says, oh yeah, it's actually a list of odds which have been defined before, and this all works. So again, if you put an even number into the list, it would uh, fail. So these are first simple examples for defining the type aliases. Now we are going to look at refining functional <coughs> results. We already did a little bit of that in the first slide. But let's look at some more interesting examples. So we have another wonderful function too. Now it's an expression. It's getting dramatic. It's not just a little bit. So here as you can see, we actually don't first define the special type alias, so we don't have a nominal typing. This is like structural refinement typing, basically, right? So we say, oh yeah, function two has a result, and here, as I already mentioned, here we could have an ordinary Haskell type, like in, but we replace it with a refinement condition. So we said, oh yeah, there is a V of type in, and there is a condition, and you can do this anyway. And there is also a shortened syntax if you want to specify more 
uh, multiple, if you have, uh, capture multiple uh, functions with one condition, you can separate them with, with the comment. So this is like a short, a short thing. So in this case, you say both one and two and one zero, which is true. Then uh, we can do the same for the size function, which also happens to be a bit recursive, so it's more interesting. So we have defined the equivalent of a standard length function in Haskell. And uh, here the interesting thing is that we have a third parameter, right? So we don't know, this is, this is a polymorphic function, we don't know well, what kind of, uh, what, what are we measuring, but still we can define a refined type. We can just say, oh yeah, there's a list of something, but the function is from the list to something, and that something has to be more or, or equal to than zero. So the list has to be uh, at least empty, cannot have length of minus one or anything like that. So, and the last example. Oh yeah, that's an interesting one. We are trying to define a predicate called positive, which will tell us that if a given number is a positive number. And we want to prove this also with using a refined uh, condition. And again, you can see here that we, again, mirror the standard Haskell function definition. So we have int here, we also put int here, but we name it. Right? So we, we, we assign a symbol to it because we are going to use it later. And then we have a bool here, and we insert the refined expression, and we say, okay, so there's this bool. And by the way, this formula, formula means that this property is valid. So basically, this means like true, but the V is true. This is how This is the syntax, so this might be slightly confusing, but this means true. So basically, we say, okay, V is true exactly when the end from the input is bigger than zero. So we can. And we can specify this uh, nicely. Now we can look at... Uh, Short question. Yeah, sure. well, why couldn't we just write like uh, V is equal to, like V double equals and greater zero like in the first example? Yeah, I tried it, you know. Okay. So, good question. <laughs> I was also a bit... Uh, yeah, we have to use, in this case, you have to use this, this funny syntax. This was pretty much the only instance of funny syntax I found, so... So it sounds like this prop is the injection of the, the value level pool into the propositions that they yeah, use. Yeah, something like that. So you're saying like, oh, this is a proposition and it has to I just wonder why they don't need to do the injection on the instant. Yeah. So yeah. this is one. But uh, if you, when it comes to special cases, it's only one. So this is really a special case only for the pool. Yeah, this is a special case. Right. Another short question is the bracketing prop V with brackets around it, or is it prop and all the stuff after it? Prop V with brackets around okay. it, yes. Yeah. So prop V as a, this propositional expression should be true, and it's true when it's equivalent to this and this. Okay, so, so prop this. is like just a function mapping from boom to the internal prop type. Exactly, exactly, yeah, it's like that. Could we, could we look at liquid Haskell running with that stuff? Unfortunately, I couldn't make the, uh, the uh, my virtual machine on this machine broke, so I had it on a different machine. I much, much apologize. It does work. All of these examples work, but I can't show you how it runs because the virtual machine broke. So maybe somebody else has it. Go ahead, class. I'll just see if I can install it. Yeah, you can, you can try to install it anyway. <laughs> it works basically just running liquid and the Haskell source, and it will produce an output. That's all. Nothing else. So these were the ways to refine functional results. Now we can also look at some ways to refine functional arguments. The first example is quite interesting. So we define a function that just accepts some, accepts some string and it's going to crash. It's going to generate never. Now why would we do that? And we also actually, in a refined time, as you can see here, we say the input type to the function is a string. And by the way, the refined condition is always false. So can you go back to that precise for a second? So, <coughs> Simon, about your question about this prop. I'm wondering, I mean, otherwise if you don't have the prop, you're not mentioning V, the, the Boolean value, right? At all. So yeah. what is on the, on the left-hand side of the pipe? You would have to say V. 
I mean, V has to be right, but V is is would have to be what equality equal to n greater than because uh, you need to say something like V equals n greater than zero. Right? Yeah, that's that's, that's what, what I tried. That was the first thing I tried. It was so right, v, just, v equals just to do like V greater than zero. What is what is what is V? Right. So how do you No, no, no. Not V greater than zero because you are comparing n. So n has to be greater than zero, but you're saying that the value of the output of this function. Right, you need to yeah. bind the, the, the condition, right, with the v somehow, the value yeah. of v. Yeah. But you could use uh, just, I mean, if if n larger than zero, mm -hmm. if the result type of larger than would be int to int. I would do this. Then v you do standard definition equality on the boolings. But it seems like they have they have their own sort of. Uh, Boolean operators or the no, no. Okay, let's take the final. Yeah, okay, so yeah. Yeah, I think we should just we have a fight already. I think we need to be has one one of our Yeah. Sorry about it. So I I'll just take it apart. But it should be relatively easy to, to build, so we'll get on. So now we have a funny function that uh, always produces an error, it always crashes. And we have a refined type that says like, okay. Whatever the input to this function is, the condition is always false. What this translates to is that if, if there is such an execution path in the program that somebody would call this function, the refiner checker would find out and say, like, hey, this will be called and it cannot be because it's always false and this is wrong. So basically, it's wrong to call the, to call the crash. This is quite interesting, so it can really, it really follow the path. And uh, we can illustrate it on, the, on another example. So here we emulate the standard division and we say, okay, we have a function with divide and it consumes an int and it consumes a non-zero, which we have defined before. Already we have an alias for that and it produces an int. Okay, great. And uh, here, if somebody provides a zero as a second argument, it would crash. But that will never happen because the refined, refinement uh, checker will make sure that this is non-zero. So it means that this execution path will never happen. So it means that this refinement condition will never fire and we are safe. So this is quite nice for uh, checking all kinds of things like even things like unimplementing methods and sort of function. And here's an example. So if we run the correct divide, everything is good. And if you try to divide by zero, it's going to fire, uh, violate this condition. And that's it. So so this is the, also a nice way we can check the same way as, uh, as a result, we can check any arguments of functions, same idea. So in the divide uh, function, do we actually need the first clause there with the, with the second argument to zero? Because I mean, that should never be called, right? Yeah, it's just like, for example, it's, never, it's not going to be called. But if you remove it, then uh, liquid husk will still be happy or will it complain? With if you remove it, liquid Haskell should be happy, yes, because uh, this is guaranteed to be non-zero, so it doesn't need the zero value to be to be defined. Yeah, it should be. So added. it's the division. Does it have some liquid Haskell type already or refined already? Well, this is the. I mean, the the, 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 the from the prelude, the, yeah, the diff okay. that you use. No, so I will get to the point. That, so the standard division doesn't have a uh, refined type automatically, as far as I know. But you can actually inject some refinement even to existing functions. There is a syntax for that. We'll, we'll look at it uh, in uh, some. Other what about Prelude in general? Do, do they have like out of the box out of the box, for yeah. a bunch of the functions or not really? Or? Honestly, not sure. Yeah. But it would totally make sense to have them. So. I mean, if they, even if they don't have it, it's reasonably expect that they will have it because it makes absolute sense. Uh, now we just look at some interesting syntactic sugar or useful syntax for defining predicates. So predicates are expressions in curly brackets, and we can actually define uh, define these and name them, and we can use and they can have parameters. So just like here, we can define a predicate positive, which accepts some n. And, and, and that has to be the bigger than zero and even. And the nice thing about defining predicates is that we can reuse them. So, unlike 
this is an important point in the field. Uh, in these uh, the refined conditional expressions, you cannot reuse refined type aliases. So if you define a refined type alias, let's say you say, okay, this should be non-zero, and you you want to say that something has to be non-zero and divisible by three, you cannot say, oh yeah, this is a new 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 type alias, and I have to want to use the old one, which is non-zero and okay. But you can do this with predicates. And the namespaces of predicates and the refined type aliases are separate. So I can define a predicate called even, and then I can define a refined type alias that is using this predicate. And it's also called even. So this is the way to basically reuse the conditional expressions by defining the predicates. It's like the little problem. So as you can see, there's a good example of this that I've defined a predicate which combines these two predicates and says, oh yeah, something is positive and odd if it's positive and it's not even. So here you can really combine the combined predicates. This is quite useful. And here is just a simple example from the code. Now that I have this predicate defined, I can use it on a function called 3, and I say, oh yeah, so the result of this function satisfies the positive odd predicate and something or, or something else. So I can combine them. So this is a good way to reuse the, uh, the, these, uh, these conditions. And this is interesting. So, so far we have been, we have been saying that uh, in these uh, refinement conditions you can use the standard propositional logic or you can reuse some of all the uh, defined predicates, but what if you want to use some like function, something that already exists or something you want to define, a real, real Haskell function? So, good news is you can, but the news is that there are some limitations. So, there is a special syntax, there is a special construct called measure functions, that's how they call them. And measure function is basically a function that you declare to be usable inside of the refinement conditions. But this function has to conform to some limitations. It has to have a single expression for every data constructor. If you are working with the... Uh, and uh, it can use only propositional logic. Or maybe in newer version, down the documentation differs a little bit. I also seen a, a mention of something that it has to be something that always terminates, which makes sense, right? So, you can use something, uh, you can inject basically your own functionality into the refinement uh, uh, checking, but it has to be nice to behave and terminable and has to be basically total. And here is an example, so we redefine a standard list of data type, we have an empty list, and we have a, a, a concrete operator, and then we say, okay, we define a length method, which is again standard recursive, and we say, all right, so length method is a, can be used as a measure function. So the, then the refinement type checker will check that all these conditions are simple enough and it's total and it's terminable, is everything nice, and then it will like, okay, now we can use it in a, in a refined type expression, and the example for that is right here. So we define the first function, which is the same as head, for a list, and we say, all right, so first, has to has to return something. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. The list that uh, is input to the first function has to be of length more than zero. So it has to have some elements, and then it returns something. Cool. And as you can see, here we use the actual length function as a measure function. So we can do this. Otherwise, we crash. So what happens if, you, if the list is infinite? Is it stream? Question. Let me try. What should happen? I actually I did try to test. Uh, I am sorry. I did try to test it on different lists, and it didn't want to cooperate. So it uh, requests to produce some errors. I didn't like the, the infinite ones. So I don't exactly remember what was the error, but that's interesting well, because you are actually returning end here. End is actually bounded, right? So there's an yeah. error file would have considered that impossible, I guess, in this case. But because it is, 
Why does the verifier have a problem with overflow? No, it, it has a problem with overflow, I mean, in terms of if this int is mapped in the verification theory to a 32 bit. Then, then it will be a problem. Yeah. Then you will say, yeah, all right, you compute len, but actually your len will just wrap over. Yeah, yeah maybe that will actually the problem I hit. I didn't realize that it just in, so. But even if it would support a full integers, you could still not compute the size of an infinite list. Yes. So. Could also be cheating and the yeah, that data that. types are finite. And <clears throat> in principle, it doesn't actually call this on, on your argument, right? So it's, it's not going to need to come. It might be that the refinement type only holds provided that all recursive data types are of finite size. Could be, yeah. I mean, you're not actually running the land on, on your particle list, right? You basically only need to provide some proof that this yes, is. Yes, you're not holds. running this. Yeah. So if you just run to a single constructor, you know, we con 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 and provide this list as, as an input there, then it's enough, right? And if it's infinitely many of them, that's fine as well. Because you don't need to call land on them, that is. But then I would ask the question first. The list, which is just um, once, so it's, it's one <coughs> depending on two ones. Yeah. Is that list part of that refinement type or not? Of the, the V list of A, len V larger than zero. Is this yeah. a non empty list with this definition or not? Yeah, it is. Uh, <coughs> So I can answer one of the questions from before. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, um, so when you actually use something that's bigger than the word size of integer, it, it doesn't notice. So you can define like uh, one to like a variable to something super long. It will overflow in Haskell, but Liquid Haskell say no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. 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 So that's yeah. at least, so, at least nah. with just the plain example that I got yeah. from the slide now. Yeah. So oh, okay. what we could do is when, when you get to the end of the talk, we switch you two. And yeah, so yeah, we, can, we can do some we can do some experiments. Yeah. Or sh should we do that switch now? Or? No, no, I, no, 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 no. I, I can just type down some things that you do, and then we yeah, can. Yeah, and we can see what that. This was my original plan actually, but the original machine <coughs> they don't go over it. So. so this is how we insert measure functions. So we can look at some a few more techniques. So. It's not just about functions, we can also refine data types, right? So we can use the refinement conditions also in data type definition. There is a very simple example here. So we define special data types, which is going to be a list of three members only, right? We use, we reuse the, the list, and here we say, okay, so we have a new type which is, by the way, parameterized by two things. This is a standard well-behaved Haskell type parameter, and this is a refined type alias parameter, right? So that's why it's uppercase, has to be uppercase. And this one is all case. So this is a list of A, and it's actually parameterized inside of the refined type concept context, context by N. And we say, so okay, it's a list N, and we say, okay, it's a list of A, and the length of the list has to be N. So this is this kind of type. So it is that that allows us to, to specify exactly how many how many items that list will contain. And here we actually do this. So for this data definition here, we specify a refinement and say, okay, triple A actually means triple. And here, as you can see again, as we already did many times, we replace the standard Haskell Haskell that that that, that definition by the refinement expression. So we say, okay, it's not a list. It's a list n of a, and the n is 3. And this is how we get the, get the triples. And this is a correct triple that will pass the refinement check. And if you add one more, it will fail. So this is quite interesting. And this is, uh, uh, I found many uh, more, more complicated examples. And this kind of uh, data type refinement was used uh, quite often. So you can really specify more how the data should be added. <coughs> and again the nice thing is this this is quite reusable. Okay. Create triple splitables. Right. There are two more useful things. So we already talked about measures which are 
just to, to remind you, the function which can be used inside of the refined conditions. And there is also something called inline function, which is a function that can be used inside of a measure. Because we already mentioned that the measures normally should be limited to basically the only simple proposition logic. We can't really do much in them. But if we want to do something, if we want to call another function, the way to do this is to define an inline function. So there's an example. We define an inline function that increments a number by, by 2. Then we define a measure, which is the double of the normal length, just for the simplicity's sake. And as you can see, we can actually use the increments function in the measure. So this is another way to inject some computation into the refinement uh, and checking. Right? Uh, and the very important thing that we already mentioned a little bit, so if you want to tell the refinement checker some properties about functions that you don't control, something that's compiled, you don't have a source for it, you can use a keyword assume. So you can basically say, dear, dear refinement checker, please believe that the function, function ABS, which is a part of the standard prelude, has uh, fulfilled this kind of conditions. So the number really will be will be more uh, greater than zero. And uh, so this is <coughs> this is not what you are actually checked, right? This is like this is that uh, you make uh, this is like uh, typecasting, basically echelon typecasting. Say, okay, please believe that this right. is happening, right? It's really used for the for the libraries where you don't have the access to source code. And exactly as uh, already mentioned, this is something that we probably should expect for the liquid scale to have for Prairie, maybe automatically in these kind of conditions. Uh, can you also use that for um, conditions on the arguments? So if, if you want to use this for the Prairie, yeah. you want, yeah. yeah, yeah. And by the way, there is another twist here, as you can see, uh, standard type plus syntax, uh, so, sorry, class constraint syntax, right? So these are all ors. This standard has the definition, you just replace one type by, by the condition. Nothing else happens. So. It's cool. This is what I like about it, it's very consistent, really nothing. Except the prop trick, you don't really have to rem remember much. So. And one last example, just to kind of uh, uh, create a bit more feel about how it works. So we have a reference function, st standard factorial, used everywhere, right? And again, we can, we can work with it. So we define two. Refinements, one says like it's a non negative number, another one says it's a natural number. Natural number, like in, you know, not in computer science, but mathematics, starting with one. And we say, oh yeah, so factorial has to accept the non negative number and has to produce the natural number. Great. And the refinement check will, will, will check this for us. For example, if you skip this refinement that is non negative, the refinement check will complain that, okay, this is not defined for negative numbers, so what happens if it's negative? So this is really nice, so like you already can see the, see the utility that, oh yeah, what if somebody calls it minus one? And again, two examples, so this is a correct factorial call, this is incorrect, this will, this will never pass the, pass the type scheme. So, so much for examples. I mean, there can be, uh, especially in the there are original articles and tutorials and documentation for the like, Alaska. There are many more examples for complicated cases. They, they do things like they, they basically prove correctness of uh, some sorting algorithms and things like that. So it, it can go pretty deep. But I would say even these kind of very simple conditions can be very useful because most bugs are stupid. Right? It's like this, oh yeah, it was minus one. And it crashes. That's, this is the least. So this is one thing I really like about Little Haskell, that you don't have to go very deep, you don't have to create an amazing refinement structure, you just like specify a few things and already it catches a lot of... Actually, this man, the, the whole approach reminds me of property-based testing. Like, quick, quick check. It's kind of the same idea, you specify some properties, right? And they don't have to be complicated one. Ex the only difference is the implementation, basically, right? So quick check just tries to enumerate and uh, refinement uh, checker actually infers. But otherwise, it's kind of a similar idea. So there are some practical considerations. So as we already mentioned, the liquid Haskell is nice that it's compatible with several SMT solvers. One could expect that it might be compatible with more in the future. It also has incremental checking support. So there is a parameter minus D that will save some state of the checking and only check for the, for the changes. So this is nice. 
and even the ordinary checking seems to be seems to be pretty quick. So, of course, I didn't check complicated programs, but uh, there doesn't seem to be an issue. They have decent documentation. Uh, also, I don't have any slides. Liquid Haskell claims to have a sub support for several editors like Vim or MX. So there is a plugin where you can, when you save the file or when you edit, it actually automatically runs the different differential refinement checking. So basically, and displays the errors and produces some nice error messages that oh yeah, don't on this line if the conditions are violated. So this is pretty cool. I like yeah. Uh, and uh, as you also mentioned, so I think usually not be built from source sources, it's still an ongoing development and didn't have much success with the ordinary installer, so didn't work, but build some process works and even at the, the auto say is still experimental, so some things might not work, some aspect features might not be supported, right? For example, I hit one uh, funny situation when uh, there was a function that was very trivial, and the liquid Haskell thought that this would not terminate. It was basically a constant, and I'm pretty sure it would terminate. terminate so. But you can decide what termination checking. That's what I did. But uh, otherwise, I think, think this is a quite really promising, quite promising uh, uh, development, and quite promising user project because it's pretty easy to use, right? So uh, some of, many of the like some of the examples you have seen have been motivated by by the tutorials and the documentation that uh, are part of the project, but some of them have been not. And I didn't have any problem coming up with those refinements. Those, once, once I get good used to it a little bit, then it was pretty easy. So, I guess it's unusable. Okay. Do <coughs> you know of any, any um, actual you know, packages in a package that are trying to use this? Or have some no, just yeah. 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 It's a good question, yeah. If somebody's reusing it or not. I mean, what I would say, if I was, I, I was doing a Haskell project at this moment, which I'm not, I would try to use it. I would probably just like, integrate it into the build. It's, I think it's quite worth it. Then, then we'll, we'll see if it would cause problems or not. But it seems promising, really. I would, just, I would just give it a go. So you might find it interesting that FP so. Complete's store package for fast serialization uh -huh. now has some liquid Haskell checks inside oh, for pointer arithmetics. Cool. Because awesome. of course, if you want fast code, you have to do pointer arithmetics, right? Right. So and that's dangerous. So they. Yeah. So I, uh, I mean, I don't exactly know what they do, but I can see them here. So I think the right job that the main guy behind it, when he did that, it's pretty nice I know, kind of workshop presentation you can find on YouTube. And one of the examples was basically allocating buffers and you know having pointers into the buffers, guaranteeing that you don't go over you know outside bounds. Just kind of there is a there's a similar example in the refined as uh, liquid Haskell documentation. Right. So yeah, they use it for basically preventing overflows. Right. There's a, yeah, there's one of the examples that I didn't include, but yes, they do this. So anyway, so that was, uh, that was it. Thank you. And uh, we can, I guess, look at uh, maybe travel. Sh shall I give you my computer? Uh, no, yeah, sure. Or we can try it. We can try it together. Maybe one question still? Yeah, all the examples we gave now were pure functions. How far can this go or can it do anything if you're dealing with somewhat effective code? Yeah, I... I didn't include them in the talk, but I saw, I've seen some examples that also deal with monad code, so it should be fine. They are also on the on the web page they are presenting that oh we have a new feature now that monad work monad work, so I guess that work. Yeah. I guess you didn't need a two step answer. Yeah. Yeah. If you on one hand uh, write all your side effect to code code in a pure fashion, so that means use monads, yes. but you actually explicitly determine when do you interpret the description of the action of another environment to an actual action which is fully side effect from through IO. Right. Okay. Um, so there you'll have sort of a, a, an additional trusted core. You have to trust that you translate the requests that when you interpret an action mm -hmm. correctly to IO. But everything in there afterwards is pure and you can use the pure theory to easily buy it. So can you also, you have stuff with uh, those archetypes there, can you also do something with kinds mm -hmm. and things, so higher, uh, high kind of types, I don't know, like uh, proofs of monad laws or things like that? Mm -hmm. You mean, uh, 
Annotated in the monoclass with the liquid type yes, on what you would expect, and then that should yes. be translated to a class instance. Yes, so uh, the fire annotated position, I think not only with instance Mona, but instance something, some refined Mona class. Um, and I have to check with my laws are already and stuff like that. But also, uh, how will you translate that to the SMT? We should probably sit on the other side. I think it yeah, should be yeah, yeah. 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 should be able to translate Well, okay, SMT is always a bit limited yeah. with quantifiers. Which is so easy to say, like, if there is some type that uh, defines a condition, and if there is a type that that creates a, uh, a condition with, for which there is a only a subset of values valid, so it considered to considered to be a subtype. Can you show the example again with the prompt mm -hmm. question that we had? Maybe we can try that. Too. Yeah, I don't Probably. remember. Yeah, 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 I, I think. I mean, It was, was positive. Okay. Uh, okay, so this was. Like this, right? Yeah, that is there right. we had. Positive okay. M is not one, M is greater than zero. Okay, and this is all construct. That is the. Curly brackets. Okay. V all and I condition prop V is equivalent to n greater than zero. Yeah. And yes, that should be like this, right? Like that. Yeah. Okay, so by the way, I just noticed that for for the mod case, right, maybe the difference is that we in the other example we actually wrote yeah, I yeah, mod this, right, which is not like yeah. there's no it is, it is like this, yes. So it's an inbuilt thing. It is in it doesn't yeah, it's so probably all automatically lifting to prop or something like that, no? Yes. Okay, so definitely. let's see what it says. And this is also consistent with the fact that in order to use Haskell functions inside of those conditions, you have to make them mesh the meshes, right? So you just can't use just any just any function. But but that, that, that doesn't Oh wait, so that, that's that's this a is what problem, I, right? Because this is what I usually the, try now, right? usually the set Yeah. Oh, but that's that's, that's, that's it. Let's try it. Oh I see. So I see what you're saying. Uh, there's no more explicit also. parents perhaps? Wait, wait a second. So you mean like this? We can try that. Or what are we missing? No, 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 no it's good. Yeah, okay. Can you parse? It's even the parse are rejecting. It doesn't, doesn't have equals. Like equals. Yes. Right. What about this? So if I just... You can try one equals, just for fun. Right? Sorry, where is this or one? Try not equals, just okay. for fun. Right? Oh. I just always have to wait a bit until the SSH. Oh, okay, that has mark. Let's and try. then what does it tell you? Not equals stuff. This uh, thing here, right? <laughs> just wanted to see, maybe it tells us what it's... No. So, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's one of the... 
So that's that's. It just needs its prop. Yeah. Okay. Sort of okay. Yeah. What, what happens if you replace? Oh well, yeah, that's I if you have an AST and then ah, you mean yes, it's just straight for it. Yeah. 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 And then you can. It's so hard. You to you mean you, you mean in this example? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you mean you mean in this example? Yes. I, I guess nothing happens because this is already the unbounded in, in their language, right? Or let's just see if it's exists. But no, it's going to be segregated. Put one equals, you know, I don't know what the uh, most people. No, it's going to be segregated of integer and int in the function. You have int and the one and many zeros. Okay, but, okay, check this. So it says it, it at least knows what that is here, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. So I think that's what Andreas Simon mentioned that there is already an issue open for for the yeah. that it is unbounded. So I'm guessing they might want to change that. So if I change Hopefully. this, if no, I change are. this to, like, does it know what this is, for example? You also have to change the, the type of the thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. But I wonder, do I have to do that before? Oh, oh, okay. It doesn't know okay, this. Okay, so that you need to import it. Yeah. Let's try that. Then. Be safe. Huh? Okay. Okay. No, okay. Even though minus one is a crappy one, you could have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, word sixty four. Okay. So if I now go back to this thing here, and I oh, know I don't have a yeah int thirty two, right? Yeah. This is. Oh, sixty four right? would be nice. So here, you mean I can try the wrong. Uh, no. So change the type. I think yeah, if, I, if I change this, of course. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. Yeah. I would expect this error to come from the core extraction oh. phase. So the core that is extracted, if you link that, it's not going to be safe. It's not going to be compatible to this. So it finds there on the Haskell side that they're not compatible, but of course it depends about it. Hmm. Where well, you can replace all uses of in, right, by this, and then you're good. I don't mean. No, I mean, you can just not use the int type in Haskell, you can just use int32 or int64 explicitly, and then you can use look in Haskell everywhere. No, but this is the same result we had with int. A different result would be if you type in a really big number. Oh, one second, you mean that it will still actually... Yeah, it will still yeah, actually... Yeah, mismatches actually, yeah, because you're, you're right. saying it's a positive number. I, I should try it, right, one second. So take int16 and then... Um, this was... Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Right. Or add max fun. More. 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 <laughs> <laughs> More. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, one sec. That's going to be very interesting. Actually, I don't okay. really need that many here. Where's the negative number? Here we go. All right. So, let's start okay. it. Save. Save, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Can we try the, the length thing that we discussed with the ones list? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Specify if I'm in type or in necessarily. 
Uh, let's first see that this works and then we can, we can just, start. Just produce an error there, basically, you don't have to call correctly. Right? So, I'll merge this guy for, for the other. Yeah. 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 I have this one parameter that is called. Oh, yeah, this was a problem actually. Yeah. Like so I had to disable. Uh, what's the, uh, I had to disable the termination so checking for this, for this example. Uh, uh, there is a uh, common parameter. Uh, if you go at no the. No termination, not termination. Yeah, general that notion of the termination. Right. Yeah. And this is recursion. Also, it's a bad application. Well, maybe it is just that you can actually pass in the if values here, right? And then you will terminate. So I think maybe you can put a constraint that this that 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 this thing needs to be a finite list, right? What if you make it strict? This thing here. Yeah, I mean, just that it can't be infinite. No, it can, right? I mean, if you make it strict. It can't be infinite, right? Well, it can, but it's still just loop, no? Even if it's strict, you can still construct the... Yeah, but the, if the, in the constructor... E e even if I make the constructor strict, it still doesn't know that... I mean, it will not forbid me to create one, right? But you couldn't create an infinite value. It would, you would already not terminate on just operation. looking at yeah, the right, values. Right, so but right. It's, it's, oh yeah, right. It but it's not it's something that will just fail at runtime, right? Yeah. I mean, Nikit has probably what you know. Yeah. Or, or yeah, probably. Yeah. So, but we wanted to check first this thing here, right? Yeah. So, what do I do? So we can just uh, produce an error there. We don't need this first question. So, so just, just throw an error. Oh yeah, like this? Yeah. Well, we haven't specified anything yet, right? So that's yes. So we specify a refinement there for a function first. That's first. And we have V is the list of A. And the condition is land V has to be greater than zero. Okay. And then after the curly brace, we specify the output output type, which is A. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay, and if you drop the condition on, on so then V, this one, just make it true. Yeah, that's good. Can I write this? Yes. That should do. Oh, that is true. So it's happy. Okay. And if you make it false, it's gonna work. So no input will be. Uh, what? Well, why should we? No, it's no it's if it's true, it should it should uh, complain, right? Yeah. Oh. But it's never called, right? So this is for If you put the false in the return type, then it should complain. Oh, yeah, right. Like, instead of a such that false, then it should complain. Yeah, because we don't call it this, it doesn't apply to false. Yeah. So for, false here would mean this. If we try to call it, exists, let's, let's right? try to call it on a, on a real list. And if we try to call it now, it's going to crash. Right. right. That's first, and now if you construct the list. Right. Yeah. And now it should crash because we attempt to call it yes. And what does it say? Yeah, okay. It says that yeah, it's false then. No, but now it complains because you used it, not because it's and yeah, 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 we complain because we used it. So we just kind of use it. Well, I don't understand why the, if, you, if you have true instead of false there. Here? Yeah. Why does it what have this time? I think anyone? It might be that A is not refined, I mean Error is a so value of a. I guess the question is, what about error? Is it yeah, error defined that right. it's false? That it's unique to false or not? Probably not. Then. Because you you had a cr you had crash with the refinement, right? Yeah. Can you can you introduce crash? Yeah, can you do the here? But your proposition has to say that the list shouldn't be empty, right? I mean, it currently doesn't. Yeah. So it just so we want runs it. with anything you oh, you okay. call it. I think well, it was I, want, I, want, I want to tell me that it's wrong. Right, right. so you need to yeah, really fix the proposition. The proposition is not like you so can so call it with any list, but the proposition, for crash. the proposition is that the list shouldn't be empty. Right, I want to so fail to the penalty. Right, and right. Then I have to fix the proposition. And it's always false. You have to replace the true with like, make sure that the land doesn't return another thing. No, I see what I mean. I want to see that the crash, because the crash, it's in the first fault. And because it's in the first fault, it's bad. This means that the crash should never be called. Conclude false. The problem is it doesn't know that the error is bad. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's why I want to use crash. No, no, sorry. My mistake in the A is to be there. Yeah, or just to the refund. Message is not. 
Oh, right. Right. Yeah, uh, or right. actually do the... Well, you, you can now do the assumption, right? You can okay. Okay, so this was just the case before yeah, because yeah, there was no... Refund. We didn't have this for error, Yes, right? yeah. Uh, could we actually so just evaluate it? Can, can, can we introduce this for functions that we don't define? Yeah, yeah. that's what can I can do. This? This yeah, you can, you can do it with the assume, yeah, assume, assume, assume error. Like, like, so basically, you do exactly the same thing and just like assume, assume it. Yeah. Okay, let's put that somewhere else and then error here again, right? Yeah. This should be totally great. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> Perfect. So I assume it works. Okay. That's quite nice. That's, that's nice. So with this you can then like really introduce arbitrary things that you claim are... Yes, axioms yeah. basically. You say, oh yeah, this, this holds. And then it will uh, infer based on this axiom to the report. So could we now define once, which is equal to one column column once? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's try it. We are right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Once, once, sorry, once. Oh, yeah. We need to use our own guy there, right? Yeah. 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 All right. So that should be a list of int. And then. Oh, I see. So that's sorry. That's uh, uh, first just a list of int. I think you use your own time. You Let's use like you can do this. Well, I, I mean, this, before we we could use this somewhere else as well, right? So let's first see if this, this should work. This should work, right? Except when it's not. This is not normal list. This is our own, own, own list, so we have to use. Yeah, you need to use your own tabs, so it's not. Yeah, yeah I need to use my own list. So you probably have to specify that. So, sorry, one sec. I need to sure. kill this thing here. <laughs> so that we have. Okay, so here we use list a, right? List yeah. int. Uh, this is just the type in terms of the defaulting of in of GHC. Or we could, yeah. Okay, that works. Okay. So, can we now constrain that type to be of len larger than zero? So, can you get it to prove that one yeah. is a list of in larger than zero? Yeah, we can try to do that. So, so the, you mean that the length of this yeah. Yeah. one? We have, the, we have the measure, so we can do it. So I'd have to write this as here, a, right? As a v is list of right, like xx, right? Yeah. Like and, in, and the condition is that the land yeah. xs has to be greater than zero. Like this. You mean like s? Yes. Okay. It should be something. It's funny, like ten programming. So yes, yeah. 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 But you can't tell that it's bigger than every number or any right. number. But this still, yeah. Now I still need this non-determination, non-determination, non uh, but only because of that. Of yeah, only because of that. Let's try to. So, but can we can we express that it's not that? For example, could we express that something something is finite? For example, oh, I, I mean, yeah. It, does this already express now that it's finite actually or not? I don't think so. No, you turn it off. The termination. What happens if you do it like that makes sense? Well, but the question is, does the termination checker just turn off the 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 termination of the program itself, or does it also mean that it turns off the idea of expressing that something is um, infinite, right? For example, could you ex could you could you now say um, in this property there exists a y such that Len x x x s is smaller than y. That would be. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think this is with the. Like you can't can't use cannot use quantifiers last okay. time I checked. So, no so this first, is the limitation. No first. No first logic. logic. As far as I check, no only propositional logic. Yeah, I think that is going to stay because if you want to be able to translate to satisfy the model theory, yes. you, have to, you have one level of quantifiers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does there exist evaluation? Exactly. Evaluation. The, this will basically uh, push push the SMP into the second. Second uh, order, kind of, because yeah. So. Uh, what happens if you put there that lemx s should be like all or even? Oh so, yeah. So let's. Do I still have to point somewhere? So lemx is not two. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I can just bracket that. Mm -hmm. So that's zero, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says well, 
Can we get the debug output? <laughs> this is not a good justification. <laughs> What's the justification? Well, I, kind of sorry, should, should I make no, it? No, it more looks like it's missing missing pieces. Oh. Uh, basically, it says that, well, it knows that the length is bigger than one right there. It says, like, length is one plus something, which is, like, another call to length. And it says this is not good enough guarantee that it will be divisible by two. Mm -hmm. So, more or less. Slightly less readable, but... But it's as though you could. So let's try to... If you write it's bigger than 10, that would work, right? Sorry. Uh, uh, okay, then. Well, I guess, right? It's, I think that's what we tried before, right? That's it okay. Of course, not now it's now zero, it should, but... Uh, but no, this would be better, right? Okay, do it bigger than... Billion or however large. <laughs> Put the zeros in. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's probably okay. more an exercise in this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and what happens if you want smaller than that? What, what does it say? So, I guess. That's interesting, yeah. Okay, let's check. Maybe we should first. Okay. It helps. It cannot guarantee that. But bro, can you can you ask it to output the SMT into the for the solver? Like what are the causes in general? Uh, maybe there is a switch, but in the quick minus minus you can do minus minus help. Yeah. So I can see here how you specify to use a different solver, but I don't try minus minus help because there are some things that are not documented in the okay. Oh actually um, oh, no, I actually went to the top. There was something about the high order. Huh, hello, high order binders into the logic. That's no, funny. Okay. okay. So, maybe, so maybe there is some support. Maybe we could try this yeah. finite. But this. I don't know the syntax. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, safe query. Wait, safe query. Fixed point query file. Maybe. What, what's, what's a fixed point in this case? If you have reason about uh, recursive functions, okay. you need to ask that whenever you call yourself, you need to assume that. But I mean, is it is it a is it some is it a thing that goes into our solver program or is that something else? I think Probably. we could just turn on verbose. Did you see that at the bottom? Okay. Oh, there's a verbose thing. Alright. Oh. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Honey, can you see you in the morning? Oh, actually, I yeah, have this very accurate perception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this is something to start for. So it actually is going for, for the core, right? It is actually for the core. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I don't know, is, is this now? No, this is not yet what we pass into into Z3, for example, right? Oh, it it looks like very much like something. I don't know what that looks like. Is, is this like, has anybody used those programs directly? Like an SMT solver, is this like textual input that you give it, or? Could be. I used it about three years ago. I don't remember exactly. Yeah, quick look at the sets of your website. Well, it I mean, sounds like it defines a theory. I mean, you define it for the constants, then it has a lot of efficient, uh, has a graph based representation of the terms, such you can have short representations of large terms. I was just seeing if it writes it somewhere, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Here, right? In it probably is only sublime standard input that I guess. Right? Judging on the in parameter. Yeah. Okay, where we could look for it. But okay. Anything well, else we should try or? There is a par parameter that's called string theory. <laughs> 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 Shall I use it or? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean maybe? Do you think this maybe solves our bounded integers problem or? Probably <laughs> solves all overflow, right? It probably paints it's something in your yeah. terminal in OCR. That's the I think the the standard syntax or something. Oh, it's a little All right, I guess I have to upgrade that. Uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to show um, what I just found with the store stuff, right? So maybe they don't think they understand us. Oh yes, yes, they use your finance, right? So 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 if you go here to store this byte buffer thing, then here seem to be some liquid things. So let me just search for this guy, right? Oh, Let's look for some refinements. Oh, oh there is there, there are well, for the database. BGRF all kinds of refinements about size exactly. Okay, so you can also just use like full record syntax and stuff. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. Like, you can do an example, but you can. We can imagine where you can replace the type with the with the refinement. Or here that for okay, but this this somebody asked about side effects, right? Looks like you can just do that. Yeah. Like here that this available byte is bigger than zero, right? Inside I/O. Okay. And here the user some just looks like contains a magical array, I would guess. So is is contained here? Is that actually? Let's try to find it if it's a measure or not. That's actually this thing here, right? Yeah, it's here. Oh. Okay, so record accessors, do they become measures automatically? Then I guess. Uh, well, they, they are type constructors, so you can use them. Yeah. Right? Okay. So. I'd still be interested if you can do anything with the strictness or strictness. Oh, yeah, right. construct. So you are saying that if we put some some strict annotation into I think I need a strict annotation list A, right? On this the one, right? Stuff, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's the right one. And not this one. That's this one. Without verbal <laughs> Um We don't need this, right? I mean, is it that now it doesn't work? Uh -huh. no, it's um, no, we needed to say, we needed to have, we yeah. need an example, right? Yeah, you can uh, we just leave can it and can just change the condition for a greater to zero, so it works. Yeah. This for, for once. can we do it on land itself as well? I mean, do we want to say, like in your other example, that mm -hmm. the output of land is uh, bigger than zero, or? Mm -hmm. Or no, we just do land, land here, right? Here, 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 here. Here. 
make it to the smoke. It's greater than that. Greater than zero. It's greater than. Just change the greater than and even the number. That's fine. Okay. But maybe not something that overflows, no? Well, it's not that I guess. No, it's good. Over. So I would hope this to break. Uh, you still have to have a break. Well, if you I, I'm not sure if it, I mean, maybe it can't, maybe it doesn't use that, right? Well, for this to break, you'd also have to say generate verification conditions that guarantee that whenever you force the top load version, that it will terminate. I mean, this is like termination checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also have to know termination for that to come out. Right. Aha, uh -huh. here we are. No, but this was, was this not there before? Right? Yeah, but this one was, but we, we got the second one, but the second one wasn't there. Yeah. Okay. Try again now, without the annotation. Yeah, there's no uh, there But you just can't implement length like this, right? If you check for termination, you can't use length. Honestly, why doesn't it find that? I'm also surprised. Does it have the believe me kind of thing that it does? <laughs> Well, you could just check it for the strictness, for example, you could just write, write the debug thing somewhere and see if it's the same for whether when you have it or not, right? Like this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. That's just core. That's why the SSH FS was too slow because it writes all this crap through my connection. So it's HTML file, right? Oh, pretty Oh, cool. That's nice. Why, why is it red? Because it's bad, or is yeah, this so that's the one that violates the that the process problem? Right? Okay. Can we look at the JSON file and the SMP file? I'm not really curious. JSON um, file will be the same, should be, I think, the output in the JSON format. If I'm not so mistaken. you're looking at this JSON file? Yeah, it's probably the SMP. Let's yeah. look to. Uh, okay, this is, the, this is the output in the JSON format, I think. See if the if the length actually works um, with termination turned on. I think that the length function didn't work with termination turned on when we didn't have a strict type, and now maybe it does. Uh, maybe it still doesn't. I think it complains about first case, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it complains about first case, which is fine. About this thing, you mean it complains? Yeah, about about length. Yeah, but this is the first thing. Yeah. Which just doesn't sense. really have much with, with yes. Yeah. 
So you want it here? Okay. This might be a bit weak because I took this one. This was in the, in the official examples actually, and it was like this. So you mentioned any contamination and this will be. So in terms of error messages, um, I guess, I mean, so far most error messages seem like it just says, no, can't do it, right? Yeah. Well, what it does is it actually lists the set of conditions that have been violated, but it doesn't necessarily tell you which one was violated. So like, you know, these conditions don't hold. <laughs> and it probably just matter of, of talking with SMP solver, right? Because it's SMP solver tells you, you know, answer. Yeah, probably. That, you know, that means no. It could give you yeah, the unsatisfiable course. Right, right. Yeah. Or something like that. Or, or it's, it's not the problem, I mean, for, for SAT solving, it's very easy to give you the certificate that's correct. Mm -hmm. But the certificate that's not correct, you know, sort of have to compactly cover the search space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what they call this unsatisfiable core. Mm, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I think you, okay, you might know more about the SMT representation of a certificate that something is not satisfiable. Um, it's something in the set of core, but I don't know really how they... How they and it's probably dependent on the solver itself, like how exactly it traverses the search space or... Yes, I guess so. But it's... Actually, I think you normally get somehow uh, you, I mean, if you don't get a certificate, unset is not an MP, right? So you cannot get the certificate, yeah. something is not satisfiable, but you can get a core that somehow you get a small subset of things that are um, not simultaneously satisfiable. Which makes sense that we get a set of right. unset as well. So another short question. Um, so far, like even in this example, in this real world example here, on our a store package. Most of these things seem to be fairly simple data types, like maybe a record containing a couple ins, this kind of thing. Um, but does it does it also scale up to using lots of let's say can I if I want to prove something over like maps of sets to maps of maps of yeah. like some types of something like is do, do you know if this is still just yeah. as easy going as this thing, or does it become complicated? The author standard is perfectly doable, so they have some more complicated examples as well. So, should be quite alright. I think there was also recently a blog post where they were proving all sorts of things about, I don't know, their Fibonacci function or something yeah. like that. So they have several, several like, use mm. test cases, and yeah. mm. they prove them. Some of them are pretty complicated. No, what I meant is just like even for the Fibonacci function, you typically work on whatever numbers, yes, right? Yeah. I'm just wondering, can you use this to, can you use it immediately to pre express difficult um, properties in in whatever your business logic or what, right? I saw an example that they proved uh, some uh, refinements of trees, for example. So it's a bit more complicated, mm -hmm. repressive structure. So there are things like that. Right, and one of one thing that I want, might want to have is something like the, I always are able to lock up certain values in a month, right? Yeah. Uh, they have this one, that one called. That's one of the actually yeah, first examples. Uh, so that would help you with this, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the specific image of that.